Good morning, all, and uh, Ramadan Kareem to all. I'm Arvind Shekhar from DigiConnect, a division of the Great Minds Group. Along with my colleague Zuhaib, I will be running today's session. The first day of the holy month is a great day to speak about uh, food security, isn't it? And I welcome everyone to the fourth edition of the MENA Food Security Digi Conference. And uh, today's session is focused on transforming the MENA food production by modernizing farms. Firstly, I'd like to thank all the advisors and the speakers of this conference who have helped us in shaping up this program. And a special thanks to the regional ministries to support this initiative with their attendance. And I thank our supporting partners, our media partners, and our sponsors, without whom this would not be possible. Thank you all for taking this time to join our virtual discussion session today. And uh, we encourage you to actively participate in this session. Next up, we have Mr. Kyle Wagner, uh, Head of Operations at Madar Farms. Um, Kyle grew up in an agricultural region of Pennsylvania in the northeastern part of the US. Um, he has a Bachelor uh, of Science in Mechanical Engineering from Penn State University. And uh, he has amassed valuable experience in operations management um, in the demanding field of aerospace manufacturing. And now as the head of operations for Madar, he's focused on bringing consistency and quality uh, to the farming operations there. Please, Kyle, go ahead. Okay, good morning. Make sure I can get the presentation here. Is that presenting okay for everybody? Yes, looks good. Fantastic. Okay, great. Good morning, everybody, and Ramadan Karim as well. Um, earlier, you heard from our CEO, Abdulaziz. Um, so just continuing on the theme here. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for the organizers for setting up this presentation this morning for the opportunity to share our message with you. Um, and as this is also, I think, our second or even third time we've presented to this forum, we decided this time to take a slightly different view on what we're going to present, so which is a bit more of a holistic view. Um, previously, we've discussed at great length um, the indoor farming systems we're using to produce these leafy green vegetables, uh, which dovetails very nicely with David's message just now. And you know, over the last few months, having worked also closely with IGS as well, I can validate personally that they have a tremendous system there as well. And hopefully we look forward to welcoming them to this region in the coming months. So today we're not gonna be focusing so much on the way we grow, but on the wider picture of how we get the products into the farm and then what happens to those products after they leave in the entire life cycle. So a quick uh, refresh on who Mother Farms are. And again, this is probably touched on briefly by Bill Aziz. Um, we do have a small R&D facility in Abu Dhabi, um, but we're most excited to talk about the upcoming tomato farm, which is under construction and will be coming online in just a few months. Um, and to complement that, we do have a third pillar of the business, which is education and community engagement, which I'll tie into at the end of this presentation. Um, again, a couple of quick uh, statistics to set the scene for us uh, on this talk while we're here today. I think a lot of these numbers are ones that the audience is generally familiar with. And specifically to this region, I really want to highlight two factors. One is the food waste. And number two is, of course, the water consumption. The water consumption is one where specifically, in my view, indoor farming really stands to have the most impact in this region. Um, as we can eliminate the use of um, pad and fan coolers, which is typically used in greenhouses, which dramatically reduces the water consumption. And also through the controls that we put in place, we should also be able to reduce the post-harvest um, shelf life losses. And again, we'll get into that in a bit more detail in a few minutes. So at Mother Farms, we do address sustainability more from a holistic point of view. Um, and that involves you know, thinking beyond the box, which is again, an overused phrase, um, but in indoor farming, we do typically think inside that box. You know, if we look at indoor farming, as a totally controlled indoor growing environment. It's not enough to look at just what happens inside that box. If we don't consider the inputs, the materials, the human factors on both sides on the input and the output, we unfortunately will not walk away with a fully sustainable solution or definitely a suboptimal solution. So to do this, we've adopted, like we've done in many other cases, a framework that exists from other industries. Uh, as we mentioned, you know, I'm not a, a veteran of the agricultural world. I do come in from a different background. And for us, like many new entrants in this field, this ignorance can be leveraged as a strength. And this is a case here where we've adopted what's known as a life cycle analysis, 
um, which again is something widely used in many manufacturing industries, other heavy industries. And basically asking yourself the question, you know, where do my goods and services come from? And at what cost, not financial necessarily, but more economical or sorry, ecological cost if they get there. And of course, that's a full loop cycle. So here looking at the circular economy effect as well. We apply this frame, uh, this framework to indoor farming. And what we end up with is something that looks a bit like this. So I'll walk you through the slide for a few minutes here and pick out some really, really important details. So we actually embarked upon this journey uh, with somebody um, from an academic circle last year, and we'll be publishing these results uh, later on this year. And what we do, first of all, when you look at a life cycle analysis is you draw a system boundary. Again, it's that box that I referenced earlier. So for us in indoor farming, you see that dotted line that represents all the inputs, whether that's material inputs, energy inputs, and the infrastructure, the actual you know, building itself, and it's looking at the waste streams. For the purpose of this activity, as you can see, we've excluded what happens after the product leaves our farms because at that point it's no longer under our control and there's a number of variables and other factors there which we can maybe influence but can't have direct control over. So let's dive into the details here a little bit further. When you look at the results of you know, what goes into uh, sustainability, you ask, your, ask yourself the question, how do we measure that? You know, how do we measure sustainability? When that question is asked, typically the answer that comes to most people's mind is one looking at greenhouse gas emissions, most specifically carbon dioxide. And although that is rightly so one of the most pressing issues to face, it does omit some of the other factors. It's generally accepted there are about 12 other factors to be considered when you consider a life cycle analysis. Other factors such as um, marine water pollution, um, agricultural runoff, land use, uh, landfill use, et cetera, just to name a few. So the way you do these analysis is you ask yourself, what does it take um, to come into the farm? So if I look at my energy inputs, of which you know, it's all coming from electricity, we see that you know, indoor farming is energy intensive. Now that doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. However, in this region and specifically the UA at the moment, as we're still undergoing a transition from a more of a fossil fuel driven electricity source to a much more renewable source, the carbon footprint of that electricity today does carry a steep environmental penalty. Our view on that is as a small scale farmer, it doesn't make sense for us to invest ourselves in solar panels or on site renewable energy generation at our scale. However, it's much more economical and one could argue ecological to simply buy into the main grid. And as the country's infrastructure itself becomes greener, we as an end user, as a customer ourselves also decrease our own environmental footprint. Now, it's not to be said that we should not take every measure we can to reduce those input costs. And that's where I come down towards the bottom for infrastructure. So as we've been designing this farm over the past several years, we've been faced with a number of opportunities to take small decisions, which have to be balanced against the capex, the today cost that we incur, with the life cycle cost, which is typically you know, op opex or in this case, you know, energy inputs. And throughout this entire process, the question of sustainability has come up a number of times. And we've always taken the best compromise we can to ensure that we have both the profitability aspect of the business. Because again, if the business itself is not viable, then we're not making any impact. But of course, obviously doing so in a way not to have an outsized environmental footprint. Looking at the infrastructure, then we ask ourselves questions again, where did this material come from? Let's just look at the superstructure of the building. It consists of steel, sandwich panels, and some concrete. And you dive a bit deeper and ask yourself, okay, where is that steel coming from? How is that steel produced? How is it getting to my site? When you start going into this level of detail and you start uncovering some very sometimes uncomfortable truths uh, to quote Al Gore, or we could also say that we can find some new opportunities. Surprisingly enough, generally sourcing locally is the best option, but due to manufacturing methods and the energy used in those manufacturing methods, Sometimes a counterintuitive solution may come up where actually outsourcing from another country may actually carry a lower environmental penalty. We've gone to that level of detail throughout the entire sourcing process. And as a result, I can confidently say that the materials and the sourcing decisions we've taken are the most well-informed that we could take. Finally, I move to the left to the material inputs. And again, this is a topic we spend a great deal of internal time and effort discussing. Now let's dive deeply into the packaging aspect because this is one that comes to mind quite frequently. Obviously, there is a shift away from using plastic. I mean, plastic has the images in our mind of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, of the straws in the ocean killing marine wildlife. And these are true and images we do need to be addressing. 
However, it doesn't look at the whole picture. Yes, plastic waste in the ocean is a problem, but let's look at the overall environmental imprint. Living in a region with a significant amount of petrochemical production, of which some of those byproducts are used to create the actual plastic itself here locally, where it's shipped via local short distance road transport, surprisingly enough, carries a pretty small environmental footprint. Now, of course, there's a counter argument that says, well, if recycling facilities do not exist, that's then contributing to landfill waste. Very quickly, one can see that the simple decision around how am I putting our products on the shelf carries a number of layers of complexity to be addressed there. We can go for a cardboard or recycled cardboard solution. Again, where did that wood come from? How was it raised? Is it FSC sourced? Uh, was that re a renewable uh, forestry practices being followed, et cetera? So the, the overall I'll takeaway message here is the devil is really in the details. So summarizing that, um, what I have here is the image of showing that the box of the farm itself actually represents around 40% of the over foot, overall footprint, whereas the external factors that I've just highlighted actually carry a tremendous amount of other weight there. Um, looking at the key findings, um, again, energy consumption is the number one factor that we have to look at. Um, the energy here is quite carbon intensive, of course, as I've mentioned. Um, but if we were to build a similarly sized greenhouse made of modern materials here, but made from glass, we do find that our structure is actually a little bit less uh, environmentally impactful. Using the indoor model, again, as David mentioned, um, there are a number of additional factors and levers that we have, so to speak, to make our uh, product as good as it can be. And using each of these levers, we have to balance, again, these three different factors of being a triple company, which is people, planets, and profits. It's not enough to have uh, the most superior quality product, but if I can increase the shelf life of that product, I'm therefore decreasing the food waste that goes along with it. Uh, I'm decreasing the trips to the supermarket to stock up on it, et cetera. So the number of knock-on effects and benefits that can be had utilizing these new tools in our toolbox. All of this feeds back continuously into our R&D cycle. Um, in our R&D process, we look at a number of factors to try to maximize the balance between all three of those points. As I'm sharing with the panel here this morning, um, some of the results of a life cycle analysis are counterintuitive and not things that are typically coming to mind. Therefore, I do want to highlight that it's important to get this word out to the wider audience. The way we're doing so is also with our educational program something we call Sustainable Futures, and we rolled out last year to a number of UA schools, which has been challenging during COVID, of course, but that will be rolled out to more schools in this coming academic year. We've presented, first of all, on the left, a really simple tool called a food print calculator, allowing people here in the UAE to see what is the ecological footprint of their food choices. Again, we do believe that through truthful and sound information, we're empowering consumers and decision takers to Take better decisions in their personal life. And we hope, of course, that one of the outcomes of that is that we see a general shift from imports to more domestic food sourcing. And likewise, on the right, a simple infographic we provided to help young learners understand, again, the provenance of their food. How does it get from those foreign countries to the UAE? And what are all the different impacts along this journey? In conclusion, again, um, if we're talking about sustainability, I think the devil is in the details. That's really the key takeaway for me here this morning is that we don't just gloss over and look at the high level terms and really get into details of what drives that. Finally, just to close with a few action points for those of you in the audience today. Um, obviously, there's a lot of professionals joining us on the call today. And um, I think there's a lot of things we can do within our own organizations. You know, we can ask ourselves those questions. Um, if it's in procurement, if we're building a new building, providing a good or a service, where did this come from? How did it get here? And what can we do to reduce the impact of our own decisions in our business on a day-to-day -day basis? I would add, if you do produce a good or a service, to consider listing your product in the global databases which underpin these life cycle analysis. These are open source databases, typically it's free to list your product. And in doing so, what you're doing is not only you're getting your name out there to more uh, potential users globally, but you're actually helping those users ultimately take a more informed decision when it comes to their own procurement processes. Finally, I'll end with uh, kind of a catchphrase, you know, let's buy local, let's source local as well for the things we don't eat. And obviously we do choose to eat local as well as much as we can. So with that, Yazan, 
thank you very much. Thank you, Kyle, so much. That was very informative. Um, that was a great talk from uh, all our presenters. We're going to go to uh, some of the questions that, that we have. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Mohammed, we just ended, so I'd like to ask you, what's the main difference between, you know, your simulation technology as compared to what's existing currently on the market? Uh, one of the questions uh, we have is, you know, some of this technology has already been used. So can you highlight some of the main differences? Yeah, I mean, one of the things is that actually the accuracy of our tool. So our tool is basically using the spectral data, which is the wavelength resolved. And based on that, we can accurately tailor what is happening inside the greenhouse and identify the, the hotspots. And, uh, and based on that, we can actually uh, deliver the very realistic, uh, let's say, result for that location. What is existing on the market, they use the integral value. So they basically average out the, 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 the light transmission data and, and they use a lot of estimation, which at the end of the day is not going to be very useful, let's say, um, to, to give the, 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 the most accurate, uh, let's say, results in order to make the right decision. Okay, great. And uh... In terms of new technologies coming on board, as you said, some of these technologies have already been uh, implemented in KAUST. Uh, what's coming, uh, what new products are coming down the pipeline? Uh, for us, I think we have, uh, we have developed this founding glass, which we can actually tune uh, the, the, the Horty scatter level, but also what we are also working together with, uh, with, uh, with Retsi Farm in the next projects, we are also trying to deliver some sort of the near infrared blocking glass where we actually selectively can 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 reflect the near infrared of the, the, the solar radiation and enable the, the power radiation to completely enter to the greenhouse. And all we deliver is also based on the durability. And this is the key point which I would like to emphasize because for the majority of the greenhouses, what we see today delivered is considered only for the day one, but what we think is the, the, the whole life cycle of the greenhouse. And what we deliver is to be able to utilize the maximum performance of the covering glass for the entire life cycle. All right, thank you very much. Um, I have a question for uh, Dr. Ryan. Um, you mentioned uh, evaporative cooling, uh, you mentioned salt water in, in uh, uh, the crop uh, irrigation in in cooling. Uh, can you define what you mean by salt water? Are we talking about seawater? Are we talking about what kind of salinity um, are we able to use or you're working with? Yeah, thanks, yes, and it's a good question. So when we're talking about the evaporative cooling system, we can go all the way up to seawater and beyond. When we talk about the crops themselves, it's crop specific. So some crops are able to tolerate higher levels of salt than others. Um, so it just comes down to what crop are you selecting. I think for the evaporative cooling, it's a very promising technology. From my experience, we use about five times the irrigation water in, in the evaporative cooling alone. So solving for that would, would really um, benefit, the, you know, reduce the, the use of uh, fresh water uh, in many of the more traditional farms that are using evaporative cooling in this region. So uh, good luck with, with all your efforts. Um, you know, I'm gonna move on with, with Kyle. You, you were, your presentation was very informative. You talked about sustainability quite a bit. Uh, can you delve deeper uh, into that, uh, into something more specific that Madar is using, maybe some of the innovative technologies? Yeah, so I mean, we talked a lot about the water uh, conservation aspect here just now in this presentation, and that's something for us which is really clear tick in the box. You know, as I mentioned before, we're going 100% mechanical cooling, which means zero evaporative cooling. So straight away, our water consumption is significantly, it's an order of magnitude lower than compared to greenhouse. The next thing we have to look at is what is our next biggest challenge to solve, and that's electricity consumption. Our biggest driver there is, of course, keeping out that uh, those high temperatures that Mohammed just showed us a few minutes ago. So even though we're using sandwich panels to block out the solar radiation, of course, the outside environment being at you know, 42, 45 degrees today, that's also driving a lot of heat. So for us, we spent a lot of effort on not just choosing the right chiller solution, 
but modeling it properly. And that's where I really have to emphasize where Cherton, who is our main uh, contractor, they've done a tremendous work in terms of energy modeling to support us in that. And the innovative solution we came out with, uh, basically um, through timing the chillers correctly, timing the light schedule correctly, it's allowed us to save on the investment of one of the chillers, but more importantly, it's driven down my energy cost by about 25 to 30%. That's a significant chunk of, uh, of savings there, really. Um, yeah, so as, as you mentioned, you know, the energy cost, saving on the energy cost is a, is, is a big one. Um, you know, indoor agriculture, today's topic, the, the, the main benefit is year-round production, high-quality production, the control of environment. But as we we're seeing with some of the projects that are currently online is, is the cost, the operational costs and the capital expenditure in the beginning uh, compared, as you mentioned, you know, imports um, uh, come in from all year round. And with our personal experience, um, cost plays a huge part in, you know, you can grow the product, but then when you go to the market, you need to sell it. And the, the market is very cost sensitive, especially in our region. We don't have much protection for the farming industry and uh, agriculture around the world is not a level playing field, right? So a lot of uh, producers around the world can produce for much lower prices. Now, the benefit is that you're consistent, high quality year round. But do you see a future where you can, uh, where you can reach some cost parity um, with your efficiencies? Uh, absolutely. And that's a really, uh, you know, very insightful question, Yasin. You're right. I won't go down the whole rabbit hole of looking into the, the global aspect of imports versus exports and subsidies. That's a whole other discussion for a separate webinar. But focusing purely on our own production costs, um, as David mentioned, it's kind of like a sliding scale. And it really comes down to the cultivar that you select, what variety you want to bring to market. Okay. Speaking a uh, blanket statement, are tomatoes a cost parity? That's an irrelevant question. Speaking more specifically, which variety of tomatoes today make sense? I know my economics very well for my business case. I know what varieties make sense today. And I know which varieties could make sense in the future if we're able to bring down a few of the cost drivers uh, operationally as well. So for me, it's more of an evolution. And it's an often overused analogy. But if you look at Tesla as a classic example we all have in mind, they didn't start off with the cheapest you know, high volume car. They did start off with more of that niche High, high value car. We're in a NASA industry. It's the same with any new technologies adopted. You always start with the early adopters at more of a higher price point. The economies of scale will come in. So I have no question whatsoever of price parity on a broader schedule. The question is not if, it's a question of when. Okay, very interesting. Yes, uh, because you know we are talking about the agriculture industry as a whole and uh, breaching price parity is extremely important. As you mentioned, you know, Tesla's uh, point that once you once you reach that, then you can convert the whole industry. Um, with agriculture, also the types of crops, you know, introducing. I think uh, Mr. David showed us, you know, trying to do uh, root crops indoors with uh, uh, I saw turnips and and a different few crops. So that's very promising. And potatoes as well. You mentioned that you reached, uh, Mr. David, you reached zero emissions. Can you can you you know that's that's a big deal. Can you delve deeper into that? Yeah, so we decided that, um, in our opinion, there are a lot of people making an awful lot of noise in this market, um, which we regard as very unhelpful. And for the most part, they're not backing it up with real data. Uh, so we decided to uh, put ourselves to the test. We invited the WWF to come to see the farm. We invited um, Zero Waste Scotland, and we invited the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency. <clears throat> and at the end of the last visit, the CEO, Terry Ahern, said to me, there is nothing here for us to license. This is the cleanest industrial process I've ever seen in my life. You're putting nothing in the land, you're putting nothing in the water course, and you're releasing nothing into the air because you're not venting. Uh, and so because your systems are closed loop, uh, again, I will remind you that irrigation is 95% because some of the water leaves in the body of the crop. I've seen three presentations this year where people have claimed 100% closed loop irrigation. That is impossible unless you're producing dried herbs. So, you know, people need to start telling the truth. Uh, and so that's why we put ourselves to the test with third parties, because we believe that this industry needs to grow up and be realistic. And I believe Mr. Abdulaziz referred to exactly that point uh, when he did his fireside chat. Very interesting. And, and one of the 
the key metrics that you showed was the ba basal. And that's one thing, you know, I, I was just discussing with Kyle, the, the price points. And you kind of showed that it's, um, uh, you know, 10% of the cost of conventional, but that is something that we haven't really seen in the market. Is that something you saw with one product, basal or across the board? And, no. uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, uh, I, th I think I gave you the number that we've done about 120 um, uh, crops or crop varieties now. And about half of them, uh, we've managed to get to the point where they are profitable, like like that one. I only cite basil because it's the biggest herb production in the world. It's 40% of world herb production. So it's a good checkpoint. But the seed potatoes are profitable. Uh, the radishes and baby turnips are. And also, importantly, the seed stock for strawberries, tomatoes, red peppers, blueberries, these things. These are important uh, valued consumer products and the big challenge uh, is getting a high quality very reliable supply you need to have less than five percent waste ideally about two or three percent I can tell you the statistic of the starter plants for strawberries alone coming into the UK is that between 35 and 40 percent of them they come from the European continent and uh, uh, sometimes uh, Egypt or Morocco uh, 35 to 40 percent of them are never planted because they're damaged or diseased or they have pests on them and it costs that sector alone 12 million pounds a year so we we have now figured out how to produce across a variety of strawberries and tomatoes and so on starter plants to uh, about 40 45 centimeters flowering first fruit uh, and then they're in a very healthy state to go out into uh, a, a glass house such as the ones that we heard about earlier so um, that's a really important statistic and the profitability there is not on a unit basis it's on a crop basis uh, because people are buying hundreds of thousands maybe sometimes millions of starter plants for industrial operations uh, yeah uh, especially you know you're talking about potatoes you're talking about strawberries and uh, these are in the in the Gulf region, you know, a lot of farms are being set up, but this kind of support services, the seeds and, and the root stocks are not readily available and they're being imported. So, uh, you know, tackling that kind of challenge is is important for a region like this. Yeah. Um, you know, if we don't have any more questions from uh, the people listening to this, I think that wraps it up. Um, I'd like to thank you all for this very informative session. And uh, Mr. Arvind, we are, we are able to move on. Thank you very yes. much, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.